Oh, okay. Okay, okay. All right, definitely got to learn this stuff. <laughs> so, so the way we've been handling questions from the students is yes. they'll type in the chat. So okay. um, whatever is your preference, if you want to just sort of glance at it every now and then, or if you would like one of us to read out the questions for I, I, you. I will try to glance at it, but if you notice that I'm not looking at it, you can just yell at me. Okay. Okay. That sounds yeah. reasonable. That's pretty much what we've been doing for the last three weeks. So. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. We're in the home. It's been going quite well, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I looked at some of the recorded uh, lectures just to get an idea of how people were handling things. But. The most interesting lectures to watch actually are Martin Schmaltz's. He, he went to Home Depot and bought a four by eight sheet feet of uh, a piece of plywood and then painted it with something called blackboard paint. That's what it was. I, I, I looked like a blackboard to me, but I think yes, yes, it was, it's a homemade blackboard. The disadvantage of what he's doing, I think you use an enormous amount of bandwidth compared to what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and okay. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, you're away from your computer. So a student would have to unmute and which you could do in a regular class and right. ask something. Right. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, you're sort of in television mode, you're right up close to things. Yeah, I hadn't used this notability before, but I can see it. it's a nice. Yes, I agree. And the student says, I enjoyed his Blackboard talks. I did too. I am strongly tempted, you know, to risk death and go to Home Depot, but uh, <laughs> myself. Feels more like real lectures. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see yeah. that. But I have a document camera, which is what uh, Laura Reina is using. And I like that. It's an analog device. Yeah. For, for, for somebody who's a fellow of the uh, computational physics division of, of the American Physical Society, I'm big on analog devices. Ooh. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you use computers for what, they're, what you need to use computers for. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, we're up to 51 and it's 9.04. Okay. I so. think we, maybe we should get started. So I'll just, I'll just introduce you briefly. Um, uh, this morning, our first lecture is the, the first of four on quantum information science for particle theorists by Joe Licken. And uh, these were these were inspired by me hearing a talk by Joe at a conference in Montreal on quantum something something quantum and symmetries um, <laughs> last summer. Uh, and a lot of this stuff kind of blew my mind because I was mostly unaware of the developments in this area. And so we wanted to invite Joe so that more people could get a little bit of exposure to what's going on in a slightly different, but totally relevant for particle theory and particle physics in general area. All right, so please take it away. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, in fact, that's part of what I'm gonna try to do is convince you that this, what I'm gonna talk about is actually relevant to, to you. And in fact, I think it's, especially for younger particle theorists getting into the field, there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, you know, work in areas that are not overworked because it's really in these connections between real uh, quantum information science and particle physics are just starting to be appreciated, uh, many of them now. And so that's, it's, that's a good place to jump in when you're a young person. Uh, I, I wanted to start out by saying these lectures are dedicated to the memory of Steve uh, Gubser. He and I actually, co-organized a TASI in 2001. Uh, he was a great guy, a really brilliant string theorist, and he died tragically last year in a climbing accident. So I, I was thinking about Steve and preparing these lectures. They're, they're actually not up to his standards, but uh, I just wanted to acknowledge his memory. Uh, okay, so I'm talking about quantum information science for particle theorists. I wanted to give you kind of a lightning review of the history, sort of the how did we get here on this? Why would this even be something that anybody would imagine doing at a TASI? Um, the history of quantum information science being a big deal goes back to 1994. And a guy named Peter Shore, who I had the pleasure of meeting at the White House two years ago, he was invited because he's sort of the father of this whole thing. And in 1994, he showed that if you actually had a quantum computer, which they certainly did not have in 1994, of sufficient power, that you could do something that can, you cannot do with conventional computing, which is you could do exponentially better on a particular problem 
And that problem being that somebody gives you a really large integer and tells you this integer is the product of two prime numbers, tell me what the two prime numbers are. And that's an important uh, math problem because it is the fact that that is a hard problem for normal computers is the basis of things like RSA encryption, which are in turn the basis of the entire global economy. So when he, his paper came out, it got the attention of a lot of people, including governments, and uh, money started to flow in to people that were interested in, in QIS, and the field really took off. But the field suffered from the fact that in order for this to be relevant to the real world, you would need to build a quantum computer with not just a couple of qubits, but uh, to actually do what Peter Shore is talking about. The latest estimate, which was a paper from the Google folks, was you need probably a couple of million qubits in a not perfect quantum computer, but a, a, a functioning quantum computer. So we're a very long way from being able to do that. But but still, the, the real excitement, I think, with quantum computing um, has happened the last, just the last couple of years. In particular, last year, uh, John Martinez and his, his group at Google, they actually um, produced a functioning, pretty, pretty darn good 53 qubit quantum computer using superconducting transmon qubits, which is one of the, the most promising ways to make these things. Uh, it's something called the Sycamore chip. You may have heard about this. And they were then able to show using their actual quantum computer with 53 qubits that there was at least one kind of problem that they can do that you could more or less not reproduce on the world's largest supercomputer, which at the moment is the summit computer at Oak Ridge. So they actually work with the Oak Ridge folks who have a really strong quantum group there um, to do this demonstration. So this was called the quantum supremacy demonstration. Um, there was actually some controversy about this, which I, I had the pleasure of having dinner with John Martinez uh, a few months ago when he, before COVID, pre-COVID, before when he was visiting Northwestern. And he explained the controversy was actually kind of amusing because the controversy actually had to do not with his quantum computer, which pre performed exactly as advertised, but it had to do with what's the best algorithms you can run on the, on the world's largest supercomputer summit, which is something that people are still trying to figure out how to uh, use these, those machines most efficiently. So the question of whether or not this was quantum supremacy was an argument about how do you efficiently program supercomputers, not how do you efficiently program or uh, perform uh, with the quantum computer. But anyway, the, the, the quantum supremacy demonstration is not that interesting to us because it was a useless problem. Every, everybody realized it was just kind of a milestone along the way. And what's much more interesting, and this is where I think uh, in principle particle physics comes in, is somebody at some point, maybe in the next 10 years, is gonna demonstrate what's called quantum advantage. That there's some pro actual useful problem that somebody cares about, might be a science problem, might be a particle physics problem, or a piece of a problem that we care about, that you can do uh, much more efficiently on a quantum computer, and, and therefore advance science by the fact that you can do quantum computing. So that's one direction that I think has gotten the interest of our community in particle physics. Another direction is that quant in order to make quantum computers, you have to make very sensitive quantum devices that you can manipulate and, and do things with and, and read out what their, what their quantum states are. So that's a quantum sensor too. That's a sensing device. And in fact, the, for uh, most purposes, the best possible sensing devices you can make are, are quantum sensors and, and maybe using technologies that are very similar to what people are thinking about for quantum computers. So that got the attention of a lot of particle physicists because we're of course super interested in technologies that we can use to do things like dark matter detection and all, all kinds of other experiments. So that's all I think uh, happening maybe uh, in the next 10 years and people have wild guesses about when things are gonna happen in, in this field, but but you know, not forever before some of these things start to happen. Um, as far as these lectures go, I'm really gonna concentrate on two things that have to do with physics, and I'll see if I can make my pen work. Um, one of them has to do with this fact. So quantum physics, as you know, uh, you make quantum states, and then you do some physics with them, and that physics is some kind of unitary operator that you can represent in terms of some Hamiltonian H here. And uh, so at the end of the day, it's all about applying unitary operators um, based on Hamiltonians or whatever physical 
things you're trying to put into your problem. And if you're doing something that you can't do perturbatively, if you have to, you're really interested in a strong coupling problem, and, and of course we're often interested in that, um, you have to at some point do this computationally, which means you have to discretize it. So at that point, this unitary operator is a unitary matrix on some convenient basis. And then you can ask, well, how big is that matrix? And, and what am I gonna do about the fact that it might be a big, a big matrix? So for example, getting back to the quantum supremacy, if you felt that you could uh, map your physics problem into a representation in terms of these 53 qubits, each of those qubits has two basis states, a zero and a one state. And so if you really ran a maximally complicated program on your 53 qubit quantum computer, this matrix in principle is, how big is it? It's two to the 53 by two to the 53. So that's a big matrix. Um, now, it's often the case that you don't really care about most of that big Hilbert space because your problem may be simplify in such a way that most of this giant matrix is not, you know, it's not applicable to what you're trying to do. And so maybe you don't care about the fact that this is such a big matrix, but there are certainly problems in which you actually are moving around in the big Hilbert space and you actually need to uh, access some large fraction of what this big matrix uh, is capable of doing. So in that case, your 53 quantum, uh, qubit quantum computer can do that, at least in principle. Um, and maybe that's the only way you can do it. So it's not unreasonable for us where we have lots of interesting, difficult physics problems um, that maybe this will become relevant to us at some point. Uh, just to give you an example of that, uh, what do we do at the LHC? At the LHC, we collide protons with protons of very high energies. So the very first part of that process is the partons in one proton are probing the partons, partonic structure of the other proton. So that is a strongly coupled, real-time, super complicated physics process. We know the underlying theory of that process. It's QCD. So that's that part we got. But how do you actually simulate that in a way that starts from first principles? And the answer is we don't know how to do that. So here you've got a, the LHC, we've spent uh, $20 billion on it by now. We know the underlying theory, but we don't actually know how to do a first principle simulation of the basic uh, collisions that are involved. We get around that by using things like partner distribution functions that are fit to, to data. So it's not that we can't do LHC physics, but it's kind of embarrassing that we can't actually do the, the having the theory in hand that we can't actually do the fundamental simulation. So that's one approach to, to trying to connect this to particle physics. And then the other approach really has to do with entanglement. And in particular, I'm gonna talk a lot about entropy, entanglement entropy. And this is another way of connecting to particle physics, which I would say is already more important and fruitful than thinking about running stuff on quantum computers, because this really gets at something that I think is fundamental to what we're doing in particle physics. And we'll get to this uh, more in, in the next lecture when we talk about quantum information uh, more seriously and, and entropy. Uh, but, you know, if you th think about it, uh, what we're really doing, people have been studying black holes uh, have realized this for a long time that uh, quantum systems get entangled with each other. Uh, because of that, uh, information is being shared as we'll see through entanglement. Uh, entropy you can think of as the information that you don't have or the entropy that, or the information that you're sharing. And we'll, I'll quantify that uh, later on in these lectures. Uh, and this is very fundamental to things that we're interested in in black hole physics. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about black holes in these lectures because that's a whole nother set of lectures by somebody that knows ADS CFT and can do all that for you. Um, but I am going to talk uh, in a much more basic sense about entanglement entropy in quantum field theory. And I think this again is, is something that it's been known for quite a long time that there's something fundamental there, but the real implications of that I think are not really uh, fully appreciated. And it's, it's a place where a young person could come in and do something that would be a big breakthrough. Okay, so that's uh, I think enough introduction.
So what I'm going to try and get through today, we'll see how well I do, is just the basics, qubits. I heard you already know what a block sphere is, so that's good, but I'll say it again. Uh, basic stuff about quantum circuits that you use for quantum computing. I'm actually going to do something dangerous, which is I have five actual experiments. I call them experiments because if I'm doing this on a real quantum computer, it is, it is an experiment. A quantum computer is a quantum system. So if you're running a circuit on a quantum computer, you're doing an experiment, a quantum experiment. So I have five experiments that I'm going to do for, try to do for you live on a quantum simulator. This is something called CERC, which is a quantum simulator that you, you can play with on, on the web uh, that Google provides. I will post the uh, Python notebook that I'm using to do this today, so you can all play with it as much as you want and, and improve it and do whatever you want with it. Um, so a quantum simulator is not actually a quantum computer. It's a simulation of what a quantum computer does. But th for the things I'm showing you, it might as well be running on the quantum computer. In fact, we have people at Fermilab that are running actual physics programs on the actual Sycamore 53 qubit chip at Google. And the programming language that they use to do that is the same program, same kind of programs I'm going to show you today. So it is, I'm not running on a quantum computer, but I might as well be. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about Bell states. That'll get us into entanglement and the, the so-called EPR paradox. I'm going to prove the no cloning theorem for you because it's a two-line derivation. So that, that's easy. And then I'm going to finish up with the fun, the really fun thing, which will be quantum teleportation. So we will do, if I don't run out of time, we will do quantum teleportation today uh, live. All right. So let's start with just the really basic, basic, basic stuff. So what's a qubit? A qubit is you have two basis states that you somehow know how to manipulate. And we will always call those states zero and one. And together, and these are two orthonormal quantum states. They could be two states in an atom. They could be, it can be anything. As long as you think you can manipulate those two states and put them in superposition, you can make a qubit out of that. So I have two basis states called zero and one, and then I can make superpositions of them. And those superpositions, in general, I can parameterize with this nice block sphere parameterization where I've got two angles, theta and phi. And so for any value of theta and phi, I've got some superposition. I've normalized the state. I've removed the overall irrelevant phase. So that's why there's only two parameters here. And then those two parameters parameterize theta is like uh, the polar angle or the latitude and phi is like the, the longitude on this block sphere. So in that language, the, the zero state is the North Pole and the one state is the South Pole. But then I can be in principle anywhere on this surface. So for example, let me define two other really important states. One is called plus, and that's just this very simple superposition of zero and one with the one over square root of two to keep it normalized. And then another really simple one is called minus, which is one over square root of two, zero minus one. Uh, so those two states are su now superpositions. If I look at them from the point of view of my original computational basis, I could even think about making them uh, all, both at once by some kind of unitary basis change. So here's a two-dimensional vector notation for those two states. And if I took my original computational basis states and I hit them with this matrix, which is called the Hedemard matrix, I'll spell that for you in a second. So this is called Hadamard, or H. I'm going to use little h for Hadamard because I want to use big H for Hamiltonians. Then you see that these two states, so these two states plus and minus, you see in the block sphere, they, they're sitting out on the, on the two ends of the x-axis instead of the z-axis. And of course, I can get from the two states, the basis that I started with the computational basis um, to these other two states by a unitary rotation. And it happens to be this particular matrix called the Hadamard. So from that, I can define something called a Hadamard basis out of these two states. 
And that's to be contrasted with the thing I started with, which is the computational basis. So this is all really simple. And of course, you've already recognized that if I'm really just in a world with a single qubit, I can do everything uh, in physics with uh, combinations of poly matrices because everything in the end is going to be constructible out of those. So just to remind you, which I hope I don't have to do, the poly matrices. So for example, sigma z is one, zero, zero, minus one. This is a diagonal matrix already in the computational basis. Sigma x though, as you know, is this guy. It's not a diagonal matrix in the computational basis, but it is a diagonal matrix in the Hadamard basis. So this is one reason why you see Hadamard basis all over the place. Uh, that's the basis in which poly x uh, would be a diagonal matrix. Okay, so nothing fancy here. Uh, also, nothing interesting here yet because you might say, well, this is great. Uh, you know, classical computing uses classical bits and classical bits are just zero and one. So they're only using the North Pole and the South Pole. So this is infinitely better than classical computing because I'm using the entire sphere instead of just two points in the sphere. But of course, that's not really true because we know at the end of the day, this quantum state, to get any information out of it, we end up measuring it. And if I measure it in the computational basis, I'm just gonna get back to a zero or a one. So it's not obvious yet that we did anything interesting, but okay, we have to be a little more patient. Let me go on and remind you a little bit about superpositions because it's, it's gonna be important to think about things in the right way here. And it's really easy to think in a wrong way. So I'm gonna do a little exercise that's in, in John Preskill's classic lectures that you can get online. Um, I'm gonna start with some wrong classical reasoning just to remind you of, of something you would never do, but uh, it's, it's, it reminds you how you can get into trouble fast with the wrong kind of reasoning. So I just told you that this Hadamard uh, transformation, that little two by two matrix, it takes the zero state to the plus state. So that's good. And the plus state is, is this superposition of, of zero and one. So if I'm a classical physicist, I'd look about, I'd, I would look at that and I'd say, okay, so now I started out 100% in the zero state. And now in some sense, I'm 50% chance of being in the zero state and then 50% chance that I flip to the, to the other state. So what if I apply the same operator H, uh, this Hadamard a second time, then what's gonna happen? So the classical physicist uh, says, well, okay, so now uh, if I'm st st actually still in the zero state, there's a 50% chance when I do it again, that I'll stay in the zero state. And if I happen to flip, there's a 50% chance that I will go up several pages for some reason. There's a 50% chance that I will flip back to the original state rather than staying in the flip state. So now if you say I apply H squared on zero, the classical physicist would say, the chance that you still are in the state zero is 0.5 times 0.5 from this first chain of reasoning here, and 0.5 times 0.5 from the second chain of reasoning. So it's 0.5 squared plus 0.5 squared, which is equal to 0.5. But in fact, if you take that little matrix that I showed you and you square it, the square of that matrix is the identity. So in fact, in the real quantum world of single qubit operations, uh, there's a 100% chance that the zero state goes to the zero state. So the classical physicist was wrong. And why was the classical physicist wrong? Classical physicist was wrong because uh, it's, this is a quantum effect. And in particular, there's quantum interference that the, the classical chain of argument is, is not capturing. So, every, so you all know this, and, and the only reason I'm going through this is because uh, there's a slightly more sophisticated way of getting this wrong that a lot of us will fall prey to, and I do it myself. And in talking about this, I will um, sometimes say things in the wrong way even, and it's just sort of inevitable when you're talking about superpositions. So let me just warn you about this. So first of all, uh, in a world with a single qubit, it doesn't even make sense to talk about superpositions as, as something that really exists because that's, that just depends on what basis you're in. 
So this plus state is a superposition because I insisted on being in the computational basis. But as I already showed you, I can go to the Hadamard basis, which is just as good. And in that basis, the plus state is not a superposition, it's a basis state. So that's the first point, is that superpositions are basis dependent. In fact, for any quantum state, I can always take that state in, in a world with a finite fixed number of qubits, I can always take any quantum state and say that's one of my basis states and make a basis where that's one of my basis states, and then it's not a superposition. So that's one thing to be careful of. The second trap that we all fall into is thinking that somehow a superposition means, let me go back to the block sphere, that somehow a superposition means that you know, I'm half in one state and half in the other state, the way our classical physicist was talking, or that I haven't made up my mind whether I'm in the zero state or the one state or something like that. But of course, when you look at the block sphere, you see the truth. It's the state plus, which is zero plus one in this computational basis language. It's not that it can't make up its mind between being zero or one. It's just a different state. And, and by the same reasoning, I could have said that the zero state can't make up its mind whether it's a plus or a minus because I can write it as a superposition of a plus or a minus. It's not that it can't make up its mind, it's just a different state. So superpositions, when we write them in a, in a fixed basis, we write them in terms of other states, but they're different states, they're just different states. Okay, so that's all the really super basic stuff. So let's talk about quantum circuits now. So now I'm gonna be a quantum computer guy I have a quantum computer. So before you go on, Joe, there's a question in the chat. Oh, thank you. And there's also a request. I think we're hearing oh, a chime good, when you get good. an email. Hey, yes, thank you. Thank you for this question. So the question, I thought we defined the basis states according to our observable operator. So I'm uh, in the second lecture, I'm gonna talk about quantum measurement and I'm gonna talk ex exactly about this, uh, the usual way that we talk about observables and quantum measurement uh, in some detail. And, and just to give you a preview of that, um, uh, I said here that in a world with a fixed number of qubits, that every basis is just as good as every other basis. And that's true, but we don't live in a world with a fixed number of states. We live in a world with a very, very large number of states which are all interacting with each other. So in fact, um, when you're doing something like a measurement, which involves opening up your system to, to a larger, to, to the larger Hilbert space of the larger world, uh, the larger world actually has preferred bases. So every basis is not as good as every other basis. And in fact, that's very important also for building quantum computers, because in the quantum computer, remember I said I, I need to be able to make these computational basis states from my quantum computer. I'm about to show you an example of that. I had better have a preferred basis because otherwise, how do, you know, how do I make particular states for my quantum computer? So we'll get back to this question. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's actually a very deep question and, and it's worth its own discussion. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk about quantum circuits. So here is an example of a super simple quantum circuit. It was the simplest one I could think of that I could show you. Uh, quantum circuits, they read from left to right and they, have some number of qubits. Here I've only got one qubit, I called it Q naught. Conventionally in real quantum computers, you always prepare your circuit with all your qubits in the state zero, whatever that state is. So again, there must be, you have to have some way in your hardware of preparing everybody in that state zero, knowing that it's in that state zero. And then, and then you do stuff, and that stuff is some kind of unitary operator. So in this case, that stuff is some kind of unitary operator on a single qubit. So that's the way I was writing things. It's some two by two matrix. And here the two by two matrix that I wrote is just sigma X. It's the poly matrix X. And if I do this in a real quantum computer, we call that an X gate. So that's real simple. And it's just the same thing as poly X. I could similarly define uh, Y gates and Z gates with the other poly matrices. So you'll see that language. And what else could I do? I can take in powers of these operators or exponentiate them, which actually is, is equivalent, of course. Uh, this is something you can do in real quantum computers in, in all the IBM, Rigetti, Google quantum computers. You, you can do single qubit gates that are powers of these basic uh, polymatrix operations. 
So I'll, I'll just give you an example, which kind of gives you the, uh, the flavor of this. So there's something I can do an exponential. I'll write it in the notation that they like to use. So here's an exponential e to the minus i x, the x gate with some parameters pi t over two. So what's that? Well, x is a matrix, so I should do a power series expansion of this thing. And then I'll find that since the square of the poly x matrix is itself, that this breaks up into two matrix pieces and one is cos pi t over two times the two by two identity matrix, which I'll write as a funny one. And then the other piece is i times the sine of pi t over two times the poly x matrix back again. So this is why you can do this on real quantum computers because it looks like a fancy exponential of this operation. But in fact, because of the way poly matrices work, it's actually a pretty simple operator. And in fact, you could also write this in the form, there's a factor of i that you might care about times x to some power. In this case, the power is this parameter t. So if you look, for example, in the documentation of uh, the Google uh, CERC, which is the program programming language for the quantum computers, there's something called the x pow gate, and that just means doing poly x to some power like this. Um, so similarly, I can take powers of the y and z gates. I'll just write one more example for you because I'm, go I'm gonna use that example eventually. If I take the z gate, which is just poly z, and I take it to this power, which is some parameter phi divided by pi, Pi always means pi in my language. That actually has a name. It's called R phi. And it's a useful kind of an operation because what it does to your qubit computational basis qubit states is it introduces a relative phase of e to the i phi between the two basis states. So you can imagine that's, that's a good thing to be able to do. Uh, I already defined another gate for you, which was the Hadamard gate. So I'll just remind you of what that was. That's just this simple guy. So that, that pops up in all the quantum circuits that you'll see. And, and that's it. So for single qubit gate operations, uh, this stuff, you basically know everything you need to know about quantum computing on single qubits. So what about two qubits? Well, um, there's I, a question in the chat. Yeah, we have a second. Question. Thank you. Is X shorthand for polymatrix? Yes, except that once I write poly uh, matrix X, I've, I've assumed a particular basis. Now that's the computational basis as I've been using here. So it, as long as we keep straight what basis we always think are in, uh, there's, there's no difference between that. But thank you. In the quantum computing books, they like to use these capital letters rather than using poly matrix notation, but okay, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'll try as much as possible to use the notation that quantum people use so that you'll be able to map it into things that you are already familiar with. Thank you for that question. Uh, one more question just popped up. Yeah. Is the R phi gate related to the poly Z gate? Yes. So, so this R phi gate that I just defined here, it's actually taking the Z gate and taking it to a funny power like this. And in fact, you should check this. You, you now, given the example that I gave you just above for how to turn an, exp an exponential of the X gate into something that you can actually write as a matrix, uh, you should do the same exercise to show that what I call the R phi gate here is actually the same thing as the poly Z to this power. That's a good exercise for you to, to do on your own. It's not that hard. Okay. And then there's another question. May I ask why? Oh, okay. So this, uh, so the question is why is the exponent, why can that be written as a cosine times the identity matrix plus an I sine times the poly X matrix. And the answer is just think about it as a power expansion, right? Do the power expansion of the exponential in terms of powers of the exponent. Uh, the, the poly matrix X, if you square it, is the identity matrix. So all the even powers in that power series expansion will be proportional to the identity matrix and all the odd powers will be proportional to the poly X again. When you sum up all the even powers of the exponential expansion, you get the cosine. And when you sum up all the odd powers, you get the sine. Thank you.
These are good questions. Keep asking good questions. Like um, there was one other request. I don't know if you saw it, but um, we're hearing some bell sounds. I, I think they might be coming from your computer. There's a request to see if you could mute those. Yeah, that's a good question. Does anybody know if that's a Zoom thing? It, it sounded like your email client. Uh, I know because I had to check and make sure mine wasn't open. Yeah, that's a possibility. Um, yes, hold on one second here. I bet I can do that. Because it's probably really annoying. All right, let's see if that works. Let me go back to full screen so I can see the questions. All right, good. Very good, let's see what happens now. So, two qubits. So now how many basis states do I need for two qubits? I need two to the two basis states. So that's not so bad, that's four. I can write them in the same kind of notation I was using before, like this. Zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one. So I will use this uh, bracket notation a lot, but I will also use a lot a vector notation for these things. Uh, I was using implicitly a vector notation in the things I was writing above with these poly matrices. So I'll use those interchangeably and I hope it's not confusing, but let me just tell you the mapping that we do for these things. So we always write the basis states in the order of what they would be if I was just counting in binary numbers. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 is counting in binary. So I always put the basis states in that order. And then in that order, if I were to write this as an operator in the four by four space where unitary operators are gonna live for two qubits, I would consider the zero zero state to be the basics, the four dimensional basis vector one zero 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 zero. And then the next state zero one would be zero one zero zero. And the next state one zero would be zero zero one zero. And the last state one one is zero 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 one. So quantum people go back and forth between this notation, the bracket notation, the state-like notation, and this vector-like notation all the time. I hope it's not too confusing. If I do confuse you because I'm jumping back and forth between that, just yell at me and I'll, I'll slow down and try to make it more clear. So two qubits start to get interesting because now I can actually connect in some non-trivial way these two qubit quantum states. So let me, Think of an operation that does that. It should be a unitary operator. I can write it as a four by four matrix. And the one that is gonna be by far the most important for us is something called the C naught gate. And this is what it is. I'm still in my computational basis, so the standard basis. So what does this operation do in terms of the, the basis states? It takes zero, zero to itself. So that's not very interesting. It takes zero, one to itself. It takes one, zero to one, one. And it takes one, one to one, zero. So that doesn't sound uh, too difficult, um, but this is an example of something uh, the, the C here stands for control, because if you look at what's happening, it looks like What's happening here is the state of the first qubit is affecting whether we do something with the second qubit. And it's, and it's doing it in the following fashion, if the, in term, at least in terms of the basis states, if the first qubit is in the zero state, nothing happens to the second qubit state. But if, it's, if the first qubit is in the one state, we actually flip the state, flip the two basis states at least of the second qubit. 
So I've talked about this in terms of the basis states, but of course now I can take any superposition of these guys and, and do the same operation on them. So this is called a control knot. I think from a particle physics point of view, you would say, well, this is actually a controlled X because what you're really saying is look at the first qubit and depending on what the state of the first qubit is, that's the control, you either apply the poly X operation on the second qubit or you don't. And in fact, you will see in the quantum books that they sometimes realize that what they call C naught is what we would call CX. It's the controlled version, the two qubit version of, of the X operation. And similarly, you can define you can define a controlled Y that says, look at the first qubit and then either apply the poly Y on the second qubit or don't. And a CZ, which we're actually gonna use here later, where you look at the first qubit and then depending on what state it's in, you either apply the poly Z on the second qubit or you don't. Just to give you a, a little circuit notation here, when I do a C naught in a circuit, I've got two qubits, which I represent as a line. You can sort of think of the line as time going from left to right. So I've got two qubits. Then something happens and the something is the C naught. And the standard notation for that that you'll see everywhere looks like this. And this is saying that the first qubit has some information in it, which is then affects the second qubit. And it affects the second qubit in this way that uh, if it's, this is actually what's called an exclusive or operation in, the, in Boolean logic, but in the way that I talked about over here, that either it flips the second guy or it doesn't. So the amazing thing is that's it. This is all you need to know about quantum computing circuits because there's theorems to the effect that anything, any program that you might wanna run on a quantum computer, you can run reasonably efficiently by just using the single qubit gate operations that I told you about and a particular kind of non-trivial entangling. This is an example of entanglement, right? Because one qubit now cares about the state of the other. If you have one kind of entangling two qubit gate, like the C, in particular the C naught gate, that's good enough. So by just combining those things in, a, in some particular order and doing things sufficiently complicated way, you can program anything you want to program on a quantum computer. Now people do talk about more complicated qubit operations. People even talk about operations that act on three qubits at a time or four qubits at a time, but I'm not going to get into any of that. You know, if you're a hardcore quantum person, that's interesting, but I think from a particle physics point of view, we don't care. Um, so that I think answers the question that we just got is can, can you write n qubit gates in terms of just two qubit gates? The answer is yes. So, that's good, and in fact, we would not be building quantum computers today if this was not true, because if you think about this from the point of view of building a quantum computer, if I'm John Martitis, I'm building a quantum computer, okay, single qubit gates, not too hard. I'm just making some simple quantum state and then doing something to it. The two qubit gates are the things that's really hard, because now I have to, without uh, get introducing the whole environment into my system, which is gonna ruin everything, I have to get two qubits to talk to each other in some controlled way. So on all existing quantum computers, including the Google computer, there's one two gate operation that from a lot of R&D they managed to do reasonably well, and that's it. And so everything is done using that particular two qubit uh, gate and then single qubit operations. However, that's good enough because from that you can do whatever you wanted to do on a whole set of qubits. So I can do it on, in the end, if I want to do something on 53 qubits, I can build it up from these small steps. Uh, then there was a, a, a question to define the diagram one more time. I'm going to actually run the program now for you. So I think that that will be even better, but if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll come back to that. So I'm going to be, do the really dangerous thing, which is that I'm going to try to switch in my Python notebook. So I'm not gonna assume that you guys know Python, although I, I thought everybody under the age of 30 knows Python now, but it doesn't matter if you don't know Python. I'm gonna walk you through this. I just wanted to show you the real thing in some sense. So this is something you can do yourself. I'm gonna post the, the notebook. Uh, I'm running this in something called the Google Colab, which you can get a free account on. So you don't have to have a computer. You don't have to have any software yourself. You do this on a web browser. Um, you upload the notebook to, to the Google Drive. You do it on the web browser and it's all done for you and they have all the software and you don't have to know anything. So in particular, you need to have 
CIRC, which is an example of a software that runs quantum circuits. It's not the only kind. There's also uh, IBM has software you can use. Uh, Rigetti has software you can use. There's other kinds of software people have developed for, for other reasons. Um, but this is, uh, it's, it's a nice example. It's something I was familiar with. So I'm using this particular one, but there's lots of other things you can go learn. And I, I'm not saying this is the best one. I'm just saying it's the one that's convenient for me to use here. Um, so you have to uh, have that operating on whatever system you're doing. Here you, so here I'm just checking that it's, that it's working. And here that prints out actually the, uh, the form of one of the earlier Google quantum computers. So that's good. And now I'm gonna do my simple example. So my simple example is a single qubit. I'm gonna prepare that qubit in, in just the zero state. So that's something my quantum computer supposedly knows how to do. So let's, I'll use the, uh, try to use the cursor here to show you where I am. So there's a command that says, I want one qubit, make a qubit for me. The next line is saying, uh, make a circuit for me. I'm gonna make a circuit now. And then the next line is saying, in that single qubit circuit, I wanna do one gate operation and it's poly x. So circ.x qubit says, I want a circuit now that is doing poly x on that qubit state, okay? Now the next uh, set of several lines here, this is doing something, this is one of the reasons that, why I like circ because you can run circ in a simulator mode. You can run it either in a simulator mode or a quantum computer mode. If you run it in a quantum computer mode, at the end of the day, you measure everything and all you have is zeros and ones. But, but for a lot of these examples, I'd like to know what was the actual final quantum state because it's a lot easier if you actually know the final quantum state. On the quantum computer, you have to run things many, many times to try to figure that out. But on the simulator, you can actually run it in simulator mode and you can tell me what was the final state of this qubit in terms, or in terms of the uh, block sphere, for example. And that's what this, set of uh, code lines is gonna do for you. And I'll show you what comes out of that in the end. But you can also run this thing, go down here, in quantum computer mode, so that's simulator.run. That is the exact command you would use to run it on the real quantum computer. So that's why I said we might as well be running on a quantum computer. In fact, for all I know, since I'm running this on Google, for all I know, they're running it on the quantum computer. I, can, I can't tell at this point. Uh, and it says run my circuit and then it says repetitions 10. So it says do it 10 times because when you run on a real quantum computer, you have to do things many, many times to figure out what happened and then print the results. So let's see if this works. Boom. It worked. Here's the results. I'll make them a little bigger. It's not too thrilling. So the final state on the block sphere you see is sitting at the South Pole. So the final state is, this, is the qubit state one. The initial state is always assumed to be the, initial, is the state zero. So what this circuit did is it started with the state zero and it, turned, it flipped it into the state one. That's all it did. Uh, this is the, the next line here is showing you in circ uh, their own language uh, what the circuit looks like just so you can check that it was the circuit you wanted. So again, it goes from left to right it starts with a single qubit in the zero state. The X there is, it says, I want to do poly X on this. And then M there is I measured it. That's it, that's the circuit. That's all that's happening. And then I do it 10 times. And I read out uh, in the way you would in a real quantum computer, I measure the qubit state. And I, so that I get either zero or one every time I do it. And with this circuit, I get one every time because all it does is it flips to one. And there's, there's nothing else to do there. Okay. Ah, so there's a question of uh, are, what are these gates physically? Are we, are, are we taking a measurement? So yes. So this is why it's going to be very useful for us in the next lecture to talk about quantum measurement because, in fact, this is quantum physics in action, right? So to run this on an actual quantum computer, you have to, first of all, prepare the state zero. You then have to be able to do something on that state. And in the more complicated circuits, we'll be putting that state into a superposition. You have to keep it in the superposition because if something in your environment screws around with it, then you're gonna lose the state that you thought you made. So you have to isolate it from the world. But then at the end, to get any information out, you have to measure it. You have to go in and say, well, what's actually there? 
So you have to do some kind of a measurement. We will always be doing measurements in the computational basis. That's the way that actual quantum hardware works. Um, and so everybody that designs a quantum computer has to know how to make qubits, prepare them in a state, manipulate them into superpositions, keep the superpositions, so you isolate them from the environment, but then at the end of the day, go in and do a measurement and ask what happened to my circuit. And this is why quantum computers are hard because you're trying to do two things that work against each other. You're trying to manipulate the system and find out what it did, which means you have to talk to it. But on the other hand, you're trying to make, in principle, very complicated quantum superpositions and isolate them from the environment, which includes you. And it's the tension between doing those two, two kinds of things is the reason why you don't have a quantum computer in your phone, because that's super hard to do both of those things at the same time. And we're only just learning how to do that. Okay. So now we'll go back to the notes. So let's talk about uh, Bell states. So Bell states are an example of states made out of two qubits. And I'm just going to write them down. They're real simple. And I'm going to introduce a notation for them because we're going to use that notation. So I'll call one of them beta zero zero. And that's just one over square root of two of the zero zero state. So that's a two qubit state in superposition with one one. And then I'll define beta zero one to be one over square root of two of a different combination, the zero one state with the one zero state. I'll define beta one zero to be one over square root of two. I hate the normalizations, but we have to get them in there. Of zero zero minus one one, so that's a different state. And last but not least, beta one one to be one over square root of two, zero, zero one minus one zero. There's another question in the chat when you have a second. Yes. In, if in reality we have two quantum circuits with very close states, how do you tell them? Can we try by many, many times? Yeah, in fact, I'll give you an example of this where I'll, where I'll show you running as if we were a quantum computer. And you'll see that at first glance, you can't actually tell the difference between the two states, even though we know they're different. And this is part of the challenge of doing real quantum computing is how do I vary what I'm doing in such a way that I can distinguish between two similar quantum states? Thank you, that's, that's a very good question, very practical question for you. So what do you, let's notice two things about these Bell states. So first of all, uh, they're entangled states. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if I know what the first qubit is doing, even though it's a superposition, I know what the second qubit is doing. So in, in the first uh, combination, it's, they're either both zero, zero, or they're both one, one. And here I'm using the sloppy language that I told you not to use, but it's convenient for talking about these things. Uh, so that's one thing, is that these states are entangled and they're actually maximally entangled. And we don't have the technology to prove that yet, but in the second lecture, we will get a measure of entanglement where we'll, we will be able to prove that these states are not only entangled, but they're as entangled as you can get. So these are the maximally entangled two qubit states. And the second thing to notice about them is that there's four states. So that's, that's the right number of states for a basis. And in fact, I define them in such a way that they're orthonormal. So these are a basis. So if you want, I can go to what's called the Bell basis by going from the computational basis, which was the four states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 and doing a unitary transformation that will take me to this basis, which is the Bell basis. So I can go from the computational basis for two qubits to a new basis, which is kind of interesting because it's a basis of maximally entangled states. Okay, so suppose I wanted to do that in a quantum computer because I, I was interested in doing entangled states in a quantum computer. I would need a circuit to do that. So here is a circuit that does that. Here's a circuit that starts with two states that are in one of these computational uh, two qubit states. In fact, the zero, zero state, because remember we always start with all our qubits zero. And this circuit is gonna take that zero, zero state, and then it's gonna apply two gate operations, the Hadamard that I told you about that acts on a single qubit, and the C naught, which is our, 
our best love two qubit gate. And by applying both of those in this order, and the order is also important, uh, we will find that we can uh, convert this into one of the bell states. And in fact, it's gonna be this bell state beta naught, this one here, which is also known, this is also known as an EPR pair for reasons that we will come to. Okay, so oops. So let us now do experiment two, yay. So experiment two, is running the circuit that I just told you about. It's very similar to experiment one, except I have to, I have to get two qubits. So that's the first thing I do is I ask circ for two qubits. And then I ask it for these two gate operations that we talked about. So the first one is the Hadamard, so that's H, that's the first one I apply. And then the second one is I apply the C naught gate and there I have to tell it which two qubits to operate on and in which order, because one is the control qubit and one's the other qubit. And so that I do in, the, in this second line here where I say C naught of qubit zero with qubit one. So qubit zero is the control qubit and qubit one is the, the other qubit, the tar tar target qubit we call it. Then I do a bunch of junk that actually, as before, allows us to figure out what the actual final state is so I don't have to run the quantum computer a million times. And in the interest of time, I will already have the result here. So if you look at the circuit here, it does look like the circuit I advertise. It takes two qubits, it does the Hadamard, it does the C naught gate, which you see in this funny notation here is an ampersand on the control qubit, and then an X, which at least that part makes sense because it's a poly X on the second qubit. And then we measure both of the qubits, that's those two Ms. And then I'm gonna run this 10 times. And then here it's, it's telling me the results of the measurement of both qubits each time. And what you see is that sometimes I get zeros and sometimes I get ones, but they're 100% correlated. Every time I get a zero on the first qubit, I am guaranteed to get a zero on the second qubit. And if I get a one on the first qubit, I'm guaranteed to get a one on the second qubit. And this is what we mean by entanglement. This is quantum correlations and the statement that they are maximally entangled is the statement that they are 100% correlated. So I didn't actually need to measure the second qubit. I only needed to measure the first qubit because I know what I'm gonna get with the second qubit once I've measured the first qubit. Okay. So now we can go back. We've done two experiments. I'm gonna speed up a little bit on the EPR paradox. I imagine most of you have heard about this paradox. I have a fancy uh, uh, little story that goes with this, but I'll do the short version of this story. So the short version of this story is I make one of these Bell state pairs, uh, the one I showed you before. So let's suppose I made that one. And uh, I'm gonna let my little experimenter here on, on the earth do that for me. And she makes this state beta zero zero, which is one over root two of zero zero plus one one. And let's suppose that in this case, the qubits are something that I do with photons. So each of these qubits is a photon. And that's in fact something we, we can do. We have a system like this at Fermilab. It's a quantum communication system based on uh, qubits and photons. And I make two of these things. They're hundred percent entangled and then I send one of them off in one direction and one of them off in the other direction. And they go for a really long time, as long as they don't have any interactions with anything else. Uh, they, they can go you know, 25 light years away. And then one of them is eventually detected on this other planet called colony A, and the second one is detected on some other planet, uh, colony B in the opposite direction. Um, and suppose I do this many times and, uh, and the, there's information uh, contained in measuring these photons, and I have some technology, some civilizations on these, uh, these two planets, and they detect these signals. And to them, once they measure these photons, these signals will just look like binary signals, right? There'll be some zeros and ones, and they're really smart people on these planets, so they'll say, hmm, somebody sent us a signal of a bunch of zeros and ones. Uh, it looks like the signal came from this planet, which they, they would not call Earth, probably. They would call it Sol 3, because that's 
or, or some version of that. Uh, that's interesting. So this signal is probably telling us to do something. So if these planets were both part of the same federation of planets and had the same culture, they might decide to do the same thing. And the thing they might decide to do is to send a space probe um, to some place that, would, that is encoded in whatever this bit string was. So I don't know exactly why they would do that, but that's something they might do. They've got some information, they're doing something with it, and suppose they, they did that, and suppose they both interpreted it in the same way because they both had the same culture. And the culture was take that bit string and that's telling you to do something. And what it's telling you is to be in a certain place at a certain time. And the certain place is somewhere here on this uh, plane that bisects, that intersects uh, the planet where the signal came from and uh, bisects the line between these planets and the earth. So that's, that's a possible thing they could do. It's a possible interpretation of information that you get from a signal from someplace. And then they send spaceships off and they say, okay, I guess we're supposed to go to the same place at the same time, so let's go do that. And they get on their spaceship and they go in this direction here and they go in this direction here. And then not knowing that the other uh, folks receive the same signal, they smash into each other and everybody's killed. So then they're unhappy with the Earth, so they go to the Earth and they say, you know, why did you both send us the same signal to be in the same place at the same time, which causes terrible tragedy? And on the Earth, we say, sorry, it's not our fault because there's actually absolutely, it's physically impossible for us to have known what was the signal that you received. You received some particular signal. Uh, that's assuming that you didn't make any mistakes in measurement, which is one of the questions that we had here. They both received the same signal. Um, but we on Earth had no way of knowing what your signal was because all we did was we sent out these, this superposition, uh, we had the superposition entangled states, and we had no way of knowing which particular pattern of zeros and ones you were gonna get. Just as when I ran the Python notebook for you a couple minutes ago, I had no way of knowing until I run it what particular pattern of zero is and ones I'm gonna get. So it's not my fault. I have no way of knowing. Even though you guys in the end got exactly the same thing 50 light years apart. So this is what's called the EPR paradox. It's, it was called a paradox by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. They thought this meant quantum mechanics is stupid and we should find a better way of thinking about things. Um, but it's not a paradox, it's, it's real physics. There's nothing wrong with it, it's quantum physics. It's kind of weird, but uh, it's real. And not only is it real, but you can prove it's what's really happening. You know, um, people have spent a lot of time trying to find alternative theories that could explain the same thing. And as I'm gonna show you eventually when I talk about Bell state inequalities, you can not only uh, prove that um, this is uh, what's happening, you can prove that it's quantum and that it's not some other uh, secret uh, way of uh, communicating or uh, making correlations. Okay. So let me now do, I've got 10 minutes left. So what I'm gonna do now is skip I'm going to skip the swap. The swap is kind of cute, but it's not really interest, introducing something much new. Swap is a circuit. It's slightly more complicated. It has a few more of these gates in it, and these C-naught gates. It's got a Hadamard. It's got a power of an X gate. Um, what's nice about it is that it actually does uh, what its name implies. Whatever is the state on the first qubit, even if it's a complicated superposition, it swaps it with the state on the second qubit. So the final state is actually the initial state swapped. Uh, since the way co quantum computers start is they start in a boring initial state, they're both zeros, I actually make a more interesting state by using the Hadamard and some power of the X gate. So that's actually what I mean by the initial state here. And then what this circuit does is the actual swapping is just these three C naught gates that sw swap the two states to each other. This is important as you might imagine from a practical point of view, which is why I included it. Um, and it's also important from a, the way we want to think about this because it shows you, this is the simplest example I know of, of moving quantum information around, right? So here I've taken quantum information that lived on one qubit, it's, it's whatever particular state it was, and I've moved it to the second qubit. So that's sort of the first step of moving quantum information. But I'll, I'll skip that experiment in the interest of time because I want to get to teleportation. That's going to be the fun part. So let me in uh, five minutes uh, prove the no cloning theorem because it's super easy. This has to do with something that you might think you want to do, especially from a practical point of view, which is to copy quantum information. So let's think about how you might do that. So suppose I have a qubit state A, 
and I have a state that's in my usual initial state zero, that's a second qubit, and I manage to make some unitary operator, which you can do, that puts the second qubit into the same state as the first qubit. So that's an example of what I mean by cloning or copying a qubit state. I start out with state A, and then I end up with two qubits, both in the state, same state A. So A, as I said, whatever that state is, I can think of it as, as a basis state of some basis. So let's suppose that the other basis state is B. So let's suppose that A and B together uh, form an orthonormal basis. So then if I'm really clever, I've chosen U in such a way that it also will do the same thing for the other basis state B. It'll copy it from the first qubit into the second qubit. So now I think I'm done, right? Because now I say, well, I, I, did, I copied it for both of the basis states. So now I'm done, right? If I take some linear combination C, that's some linear combination of A and B. Let's take the simplest example, A plus B. Uh, it should copy that too, right? So now if I act with U on C zero, I should get CC, shouldn't I? Well, let's see what we get, because now we know what it does in the basis state, so we know what it does on, in anything. So just using what it does in the basis states, this will give me AA plus BB. So is that what I wanted? Is that a copy of C? No, it's not. That's not CC, because what's CC? CC is actually a more complicated thing. It's AA plus AB plus B plus B A plus B B. And that's the no cloning theorem. Done, we're done. Because I showed it failed. Showing it failed in this one case is enough. To, actually, you can see that it would fail in general. So what does this mean? This means that in, the, in quantum physics, you cannot clone or copy a general unknown quantum state. And the key word there was unknown because I can copy a known quantum state. And in fact, we've been assuming that all along because copying a known state is the same thing as saying that I can prepare a known state more than once, right? If, if I can prepare a particular superposition state once, I presumably can prepare it 100 times. And that's actually what we were doing when we were talking about running your quantum circuits 100 times. I'm actually um, doing something like that. I'm making the same quantum state 100 times. So if it's a known state, I can copy it. But if it's an unknown state, let's say it's some quantum signal that I receive from planet Earth, uh, I can't copy it. I can measure it, but I can't copy it. So that's a no cloning here. So now we actually know enough to do quantum teleportation. Yes. Go ahead. Somebody said something. I think that was an accident. Okay, it was an accident. <laughs> All right, so what is quantum teleportation? So in quantum teleportation, what I want to do is I want to have uh, some particular quantum state and, and make it fairly complicated. So in my circuit, I'm gonna use some powers of X and Y gates to make some complicated state. That's living in a qubit that I'll call the message qubit, as you see here. And then the other thing I need to do quantum teleportation is I need one of these entangled pairs. So I need two qubits that are in this maximally entangled state, but I already told you how to do that. That's the circuit that we see here with Alice and Bob, that's two qubits. And the, by applying the Hadamard and the C-naught gate, as we already saw in the Python notebook, I can make those into a maximally entangled uh, Bell pair or EPR pair. Um, and then the trick is that now Alice, is in possession of her entangled qubit, and she's also in possession of the message qubit, and she wants to do something such that Bob, who may be 10 light years away, but in this case is just sitting in the next qubit, um, will end up with his qubit in the message state. That's quantum teleportation. Alice starts with an entangled qubit and a message, and by doing something to those two qubits, Bob ends up with the same quantum state that was originally in the message qubit. So this is the circuit that does it, and rather than explain it anymore, I'm gonna do the notebook. 
It looks like there's another uh, question in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Can I interpret this as I cannot prepare arbitrary superposition state? Uh, you can prepare, this is about the no cloning theorem. You can prepare arbitrary superposition states. Um, the, the no cloning theorem is just telling you a limitation on what you can what you can do with quantum states without actually measuring them. So, so I can, if you figure out somehow what your quantum state was by doing say a series of measurements on a bunch of, of states that are prepared in the same way, then you can always make a copy because I can always, presumably if I'm a good quantum mechanic, I can, I can make that state somehow. So what the no cloning theorem is telling you is that I can't do it in the sense that you do it with an amplifier, with an amplifier with regular photon signals, say. I, I don't care about the details of what the state is, but I can make as many copies of it as I want anyway. And in quantum physics, because of the fact that uh, measuring is, is, a, is a special kind of an operation, this is just not true. So quantum amplifiers in that sense uh, are forbidden by the no cloning theorem. Anyway, let's do our circuit because this is the fun part. I'm going to try and get the simulator actually working so we can do it in real time. That's the, the payoff of this entire lecture if we get it to work is to do that. So let's see if this is working. Boom, it's working. Okay, we're going to do quantum teleportation. And you can get the notebook tonight and do this as many times as you want. So here's the circuit. What does the circuit do? It defines three qubits. And here I've actually given this, the qubits names in circ. This is another nice feature of circ. You can give your qubits names. So qubit zero is name message. Qubit one is called Alice as Alice's entangled qubit. Qubit two is Bob's entangled qubit. Okay. Second thing I do is I said I have to make this qubits one and two, the Alice Bob qubits have to be an entangled pair. So this is what does that. It's the circuit that we already talked about, makes them an entangled pair. I want to make the message qubit in, to put it in an interesting random quantum state, some random superposition. So I'm actually going to use random powers of the X and Y gates in order to put it in a pretty random looking state. And then here's the trick of teleportation. This is the trick. Teleportation, I do two more steps. Alice now has two qubits, one's the entangled qubit and one's the message qubit. And, and what does she do? The first thing she does is she changes basis of her two qubits. And the, the, the basis change she does is the basis change you would do to get from the Bell state basis to the computational basis. So that's the opposite of what I was talking about before. You can do a basis change from the computational basis to the Bell state basis. You can also do the inverse of that transformation, which takes you from the Bell state basis to the computational basis. So that's just some unitary operator. And it's this thing we already did before. It's the C naught in the, in the Hadamard, but in the other order. That's how you get the inverse. You just take them in the other order. So that's some unitary operation I do in two qubits. No big deal. And then the other thing that Alice does is she then measures her two qubits in the computational basis. We always measure in the computational basis. So that's this statement here, the second statement. Measure, measure qubit zero and qubit one. Then there's one more thing she has to do. She's now measured the qubit. She got some information. She got a zero or a one for each of those qubits. She has to tell Bob what happened in those measurements. So that's what we call classical communication. She's it's two classical bits worth of information because she tells Bob she either got a zero or one on the first qubit and a zero or one on the second qubit. So she sends Bob two classical bits, she says, Bob, this is what I got. And then Bob, depending on that information, either does or doesn't do two operations on his qubits. And that's represented here by a, a C naught and a CZ. Remember CZ is a controlled version of, of the poly Z. So it, it doesn't matter at the moment what the details are of what Bob's doing, but Bob is essentially correcting his qubit state in order to get it into the right state, which is the message state. So this is very simple. This is, a, this is it. This is quantum teleportation. It's all you have to do. So let's do it. So get ready. I'm gonna first, let me do it uh, once up here and then I'll be able to do it easily. Boom. Okay, so now if I go down here. Oh, come on, let me do that. 
Hold on one second. You get something like this. So here's the random initial state. I pulled it out and, and uh, I'm representing where it is, the message qubit on the block sphere. It's some random place in the block sphere. And this is what Bob's qubit's final state is. And again, I use the simulator to actually pull out what Bob's qubit final state is. And it's the same state. And you can run this as many times as you want, but you will find every time that even though the state varies randomly, that Bob always has exactly the state that started out in the message qubit. However, remember the no cloning theorem. This is not copying because if you ask what's the final state of the message qubit, it's no longer this state. It's the final line here. It's actually some trivial state that doesn't have any, anything interesting in it. So the no cloning, no cloning theorem has not been violated, but Bob now is in possession of the same quantum state that Alice was in possession of before. And here now the trick is that it's true that Alice had to communicate with Bob to make the teleportation work, but she didn't have to be sitting on the same quantum computer chip with Bob. In fact, since she, the, the last two uh, things that we're, we did here involve classical uh, information exchange, Alice and Bob could have been 50 light years apart. It's true that Bob in that case will have to wait 50 years before he knows whether to do these final operations on his qubits, but Bob is still guaranteed to get exactly the same state as the message qubit. And that's the magic of quantum teleportation is that because these final two steps involve classical communication, you can do them as far apart as you like. Here, I've actually done, uh, if I actually ran this on a quantum computer, on the Google computer, for example, I would be doing quantum teleportation across the chip, which is less impressive, but it's actually the same physics. It's exactly the same physics as long range quantum teleportation. And in fact, if you're interested in quantum teleportation, it actually makes sense to play with it on the chip before you try to build a long range quantum communication system, which is a lot harder. Uh, we are doing both of these things at Fermilab. We're, we're playing with quantum teleportation on chips and we actually have a long range quantum uh, communications network that uses quantum teleportation. So we can do it on scales, not of 50 light years, but 50 kilometers. We've already done that. Um, and it's real and you can prove that it's real and I'll, I'll give you some more information in the next couple of lectures for how to prove it's real. Okay, so I think we have run out of time for today. Okay, there's I think three or four new questions in yeah, the chat. Let's go. All right. So for message, the X and Y gates are raised to particular power. Are those powers manually set by you or is the program somehow picking them? Yes, good question. So let me run it again and you'll see what's happening. So when I run it again, I get a different message state than I had before. And why is it different? It's different because back here in my handy dandy Python code here, I actually, Make it a little bigger. I use random numbers. So in Python, you can generate random numbers. And then uh, Cirque, this software that I'm using, is actually smart enough that you can take, as you see in the, where the cursor is, you can take the X gate to the random power random X, ran X, and you can take the Y gate to the random power ran Y. So star star ran X just may, means take it to the power of this random number X and star star ran y means take it to the random power ran y. Okay, so that was one question. Now, what other questions do we have here? Uh, what was classical communication here? So in the, in the CERC quantum software, the last two steps uh, we actually did as classical communication. CERC actually doesn't care whether you're doing classical communication or quantum communication. So it doesn't, it, when you do a C naught gate, it doesn't care whether you actually did that in the quantum way or the classical way, which is actually a nice feature of CERC because it means I can make a circuit and decide later uh, whether I want to do, where I want to do the measurements or when I want to do measurements. But of course, they are very different things, classical and quantum. Okay, Alice talking to Bob to report her measurement outcomes. Yeah, that's the classical, yes, indeed. Um, so is it that Bob still doesn't know the message state? He only has the state. So Bob only ever had this one entangled state. That's the only thing he ever had. Um, actually, 25% of the time, Bob doesn't, doesn't have to do anything because 25% of the time, he will be in possession of the message state without him doing anything. So if, if all you care about is 
that some of the time I get the message state, he can just wait for Alice and then Alice could just tell him uh, which of his, which of the times that we ran this, uh, he had the right state and he doesn't have to do anything at that point. He will, he will have the right state 25% of the time. Okay, is the classical communication now Alice and Bob represented anywhere in the Cirque circuit? Yeah, so that's the thing I was saying is that in, in Cirque, Cirque, Cirque just doesn't care. Cirque, Cirque I can do the, the same circuit, whether it's classical or quantum, and it doesn't care. Uh, it, it does it, it does it the right way, um, but it, it, you can do it with the same circuit, which is convenient. Okay, what do we got here? To put it a different way, the classical communication takes place by the use of an ordinary variable in Python, which is classical. That is exactly what it's doing under the hood. Thank you for those of you that understand this. Circ is just a, a, Python, a Python front end to what the quantum computer is really doing. By, by the way, what the quantum computer is really doing is it's sending pulses of microwaves into the quantum chip and then uh, getting uh, pulses of microwaves out. That's all it's doing in the end. So what the, the CERC Python stuff is the front end of something that uh, generates and receives microwave pulses. But it's for real. What's nice about this is it's not only simple, it's real. Okay. We made it to quantum teleportation okay. in one lecture. I, I want to say, why is this useful? But I think I can figure out the answer to that. <laughs> because you can now move, move a quantum, a qubit to another place. Yes. To, Use as input into another calculation uh, if you there, want. There's to. a lot of interesting philosophical questions that they involve what I think are sort of the deep connection between quantum information and particle physics. So, is what does it mean to move information rather than moving the thing? And this is a question for us because, you know, so in this case, uh, I did, let's say this was all in photons. I didn't move the message photon to Bob, but Bob got the entire quantum state that was in the photon. Yeah. From the point of view of particle physics, that is the photon, right? It's true right. I didn't move the energy. I didn't move the energy packet, but I did move everything about it. There isn't anything else. So it's, it's, it's like adding the cross diagram. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, you know, so it's, Sometimes people say, well, teleportation isn't really teleportation. It, it is really teleportation. If I could do this with Captain Kirk, and I could, <laughs> I, you know, this, actually, let's do Dr. McCoy, because he was the one that objects to this. So because of the no cloning theorem, I would have to kill Dr. McCoy. So, so the Dr. McCoy that was on the transporter platform would be gone and could never come back. But I would then make an exact copy of Dr. McCoy on the planet. So on Star Trek, they think that's fine. That's it's the old Dr. McCoy's dead, but the new one is a complete copy. So who cares? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think as particle physicists, we should have the same attitude, right? That's that's teleportation. That's all that matters. Yeah. Okay, we should probably wrap up so that people have a chance to have a break before the start of the next lecture. Um, big thanks to Joe. And Joe, are you able to connect at the coffee break this afternoon? Which uh, is 1.30 Cassie time. Yes, I will try very hard to do that. I, I'm sorry, there are some times when I, I can't do things that normal people do because I'm also a, a lab management, but I will try very hard to do that. Sure, yeah. Let me suggest that you join. We have three rooms. They're called Emu and Tau. Let me suggest that you join the E room just because. Okay, um, I will try yeah. to do that. All right, good. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks thank you very much. Session. I really like and this. The, the next lecture starts in 20 minutes. Okay. Bye-bye.